Greetings to you. Greetings on this day that the Lord has made a day for us to rejoice and be glad. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. You may recall a famous slogan from World War II, Loose lips sink ships. That slogan reminded everyone to be careful of how they spoke. Speaking wrongly could have serious consequences. So it is with our Christian faith. We must beware of loose speech. Our reminders are not mere slogans, but they are the dogma of the Christian church, the boundaries set around our talk, so that when we speak of the faith, we speak rightly. Because you have been baptized and I have been ordained, we must pay particular attention to these dogma of the church. They have been delivered by the historic Christian community generation after generation, and they have come to us in our generation uh, saying, when you speak the Christian language, this, that is, when you speak to and for the Christian community, these dogma are how you should speak. This week, as last week, and as I will next week, I'll address one of three dogma without which there is no Christian talk in general and no Lutheran Christian talk in particular. Last week, we took up the dogma of Jesus Christ as the revelation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This week, we will take up Jesus Christ in his person, both divine and human. And next week, we will take up Jesus Christ, delivered to sinners, so as to be their life. So, Jesus Christ, in his person, both divine and human. Correctly confessing the two natures of the person of Jesus Christ is necessary for salvation. As we have learned in our catechism's explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed, where it declares, what does this mean? I believe in Jesus Christ, true God, Son of the Father from eternity, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord. This is in accordance with the teaching of the Athanasian Creed where it declares one altogether, not by confusion of essence, but by unity of person. These are the communicatio idiomata. The communication of attributes. When we speak the Christian language in our faith, you, we learned that you know something is important uh, because they assign a Latin name to it. And so this teaching, the communicatio idiomatum, simply holds that the attributes of Christ's divine nature are so communicated to Jesus' human nature that wherever the human nature is, there too is his divine nature. And furthermore, that the attributes of Jesus' human nature are so communicated to his divine nature that wherever the divine nature is, there too is his human nature. One of my favorite theologians, Stephen Paulson, puts it this way in a recent book, quote, the communicatio idiomatum holds that there are characteristics or identifying features of the essence of a human creature on one hand, attributes like being born, sleeping, crying, sinning, and dying. And then there are attributes of God's essence on the other hand, attributes like 
having no beginning, not sleeping, not crying, not sinning, not dying. Accordingly, creatures are segregated from their creator by these opposite attributes. You can think in this manner of how a north uh, magnetic pole is segregated from the south magnetic pole and when they get close together, or excuse me, the, the north pole uh, repels uh, a similar north pole. So, uh, when creatures are segregated from their creator, uh, sin refuses to receive God in his chosen things. That is, where God wants to be found. Sin refuses this, since we do not want to find our God in his word alone, where it is weak and even liable to death. But in Christ incarnate, there is now a new communication, a new communication that affects change between creatures and creator. This new communication is expressed verbally in such scandalous language as God was born of Mary and lay in a manger. And the human Jesus created the world and rules as Lord of the new kingdom. That's what's how Stephen Paulson puts it. I have spoken to you before of the opinio legis, the legal scheme by which the devil, the world, and our sinful selves turn us into ourselves so that we look at the works of our hands rather than to faith in Christ. Well, this legal scheme, the opinio legis, is the one that held these attributes of humanity and of God, of divinity and humanity, held them apart, only seeing them in terms of opposites, like God, human, infinite, finite, eternal, temporal, holy, sinful. But now comes Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in the flesh, and a new communication has come about. A new communication that brings together what the legal scheme could only view as irreconcilable opposites. In the one person of Jesus Christ, all the opposing attributes of divinity and humanity have been brought together, including the greatest of opposites, a justifying God and sinners. The greatest of opposites have been brought together completely. Well, there are three ways of speaking falsely regarding the nature of Christ. First way is that he was merely human and not divine. Second way is that he was divine, but not human. And the third way is that his divine nature was merely joined to his human nature like veneer on a piece of lumber. The first two are obviously heresies recognized as such by people of faith whenever someone tries to foist off such talk on them. The third, though, is much more subtle and often used by the devil, the world, and our sinful selves, that triumvirate of powers, which so loves the legal scheme, the third is often used to seduce people into wrong thinking, and thus to speaking falsely regarding the two natures of Christ. The third view of Christ's two natures, that they are stuck together, has come to be associated with a 5th century theologian named Nestorius. He formulated in a theological way what many Christians had been seduced into believing, that no 
union between the human and the divine was possible. For such to occur, Nestorius declared, God would have had to be born. God would have to grow, to learn, and to die. While the human, according to Nestorius, would have to be eternal, unchangeable, and immortal. Thus, for Nestorius and those of his ilk, the human Jesus and the divine Christ were two things joined into one, a human person glued to a divine God like two plies of a tire or a sheet of plywood. There was no communication of attributes. Without the communication of attributes between Christ's divine and human nature, the legal scheme, the opinio legis, makes a place for human work. This is particular the particularly the case for Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Here, the legal scheme assumes that Christ is absent. After all, he is sitting on the right hand of God, is he not? Christ's presence in the here and now of Holy Communion must be made real by a human work. And so the legal scheme authorizes such work. This human work is one of two kinds. In the first human work, the divine presence of Jesus is realized, made real, by the faith of the believers participating in Holy Communion. This means that the human nature of our resurrected Lord is distinguished from his divine nature in such a way that its physicality, its body and blood, remains seated at the right hand of God, while only Christ's divine nature is available spiritually through two believers through their faith. The second human work is that the human presence of Jesus remains at the right hand of God until it is called down, made real, put in place by the proper person conducting the proper ritual of worship. By this type of work, Jesus' human nature is manipulated by the ritual work of the religious presider. Both extremes destroy the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. In Jesus Christ incarnate, who is the Word of God, a new communication has taken place. In this new communication, Christ's divine attributes and his human attributes are enjoined inseparably in one person so that Jesus' word is true when he declares, this is my body, this is my blood. Conf correct confession does not rely on any form of human work to make Jesus present in either his divine or his human natures. It simply and properly proclaims the promise that Jesus made, I will be with you always until the end of the age. It simply and properly proclaims that promise as unambiguously true for you to those who hear. For Christian life and practice today, in a world that has serious issues with authority, honoring the limits on speaking of Christ imposed by the correct confession of his two natures settles these issues of authority by declaring, one, authority does not reside 
in the realizing power of the individual believer's faith. And two, authority does not reside in the church institution's work of proper ritual done by proper persons. In correct confession, Christ's words are true. They are the authority when he declares, this is my body. Thereby, correct confession does not assume that someone needs something needs to be added either by the individual or by the institution for the word to have authority. All authority remains with the word of God. So then, to speak the Christian faith rightly is to always hold to correctly confessing the two natures of the one person of Jesus Christ as necessary for salvation. Only in this way are loose lips avoided, that careless speech which will sink the ship of the church. Thanks be to God that through the creeds and the dogmatic assertions of the apostolic faith, the church retains faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ. Amen.